Hello everybody, welcome to History of Money. We are at lecture 38, a short history of the euro. I'm calling it a, a short history of the euro because we've gone into so much depth into the US dollar. Here we just have a single lecture, but I think it's important. And I think most of you all will be uh, quite interested in, in just getting a, again, a brief survey of this important currency, the second most widely used currency in the world. So here we have it. And, and of course, the unit of account is the euro. There you see the sign there, the flag of the European Union. And here are some banknotes issued by the ECB, the European Central Bank, headquartered in Frankfurt, Germany. A 20 euro note, 10 euro, 5 euro. Went through a slight redesign in 2013. But for the most part, it's it's kept the uh, the same design since they first entered circulation in 2002. And here on the 20 euro note, you see Gothic architecture. On the 10 euro note, some Romanesque architecture, a classical European arch on the 5 euro note. And then for the one, unlike in the United States, for their 1 euro uh, money, it's a coin. And uh, so is the two euro coin and the countries who use the euro are called uh, uh, collectively the eurozone the eurozone the eurozone consists of 19 of the 27 member states now a year ago it was 28 member states but of course the united kingdom left in in january on january 31st of 2020 so 19 of the 27 member states are part of the Eurozone, member states in the EU, that is. And that includes uh, roughly 340 million Europeans. So a whole lot of people use this currency. And, and as I already mentioned, it is the second most traded currency in the world. There's about 1.25 trillion euros uh, in, in circulation. Uh, if you include banknotes and coin, compare that to U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar is a little higher, about $2 trillion of, of, of notes and coin in circulation. The Eurozone is the third largest economy in the world if by GDP, gross domestic product. The U.S. is the number one economy in the world at almost $21 trillion GDP. China is second place at about $15 trillion dollars GDP in the Eurozone is at almost 13 trillion dollars. In fact, actually the Eurozone was surpassed by China only about a year ago. Okay, Eurozone for a long time was number two. So China has been been rising. Actually in 2005 the Eurozone the, the economy of the Eurozone was five times larger than China. In 2008 it was three times large, larger than China. Now China is is larger the uh, euro also, unlike the China's, Chinese yuan, the euro is the second largest international reserve currency, and it comprises about 21% of, the, uh, of international reserve currencies. At its peak in the late 2000s, it was about 30%, so it's gone down slightly. The U.S. dollar, of course, is the number one international reserve currency at about 61%. And then after the dollar and the euro, the British pound, which is about three to five percent of reserve currencies in the Japanese yen. Furthermore, many West African countries peg their currencies to the euro. And so in, uh, you see in the purple, West African countries who peg their currencies to the euro. And if you look at on this map, of course, in the uh, the tan color are non-EU countries, so they're not member states. So, of course, the UK is no longer a member state, but neither is Norway or Russia or Ukraine or Belarus or Turkey. In the gray are member states in the EU who do not use the euro at all. And then in the sort of light blue, Denmark, as well as Croatia and Bulgaria are countries that have retained their national currencies but peg those national currencies to the euro. So 
that is the Eurozone. All right, to, if we want to trace the history of the Euro, really we got to go back to 1957. In 1957, the Treaty of Rome was signed, and the Treaty of Rome created really the, the forebear of the European Union. It was called the European Economic Community. After the extreme nationalism of the 1930s and the 1940s, there was a natural desire to, uh, toward European integration as, as a possible solution to all of the, and not just what happened in the 30s and 40s, but also World War I, okay? I mean, the, the first half of the 20th century was hell on earth for Europe. And so Europeans were hungry for some sort of alternative and an integration, which began as economic integration, began to morph into political integration. Economic integration was a, a, a very attractive solution. And you see the Sinese uh, to the Treaty of Rome, France, Italy, West Germany, Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands. This European economic create community created a common market, okay? Free movement of capital, no capital controls, free trade. So within the EEC, these uh, countries won't erect trade barriers against one another um, or unusual trade barriers, barriers. There would be a standardized system, a standardized uh, customs union and, and a common set of economic institutions. In the 1960s, the EEC took a little bit of a, uh, 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 a drawback uh, a, a bit with, with the rise of Charles de Gaulle as president of France from 1959 to 1969. De Gaulle was a French nationalist. He was very skeptical of control over of France by other nations, other countries, including in Europe, but especially the United States. And actually in, in 1961, the United Kingdom applied for membership in the EEC and de Gaulle vetoed their application because he feared that the United States through the United Kingdom would, would assert control within the EEC if the, if the UK joined. And so he vetoed that decision. So when Nixon closed the gold window in August of 1971. That put back, pushed back the project a bit. Prior to 1971, there was a, uh, one of the major goals of the EEC had been the creation of a single currency, okay? So, so the idea of the Euro, even though it didn't have that name yet, and even though at this time, all the countries of the EEC still retain their own national currencies. I didn't state that, I assumed, perhaps knowledge on a part of the Euro, but just to clarify, under the Treaty of Rome, you still have the Franc, you still have the Deutschmark, you still have the Italian Lira, okay? So they each had their national currencies, but under Bretton Woods, as you recall from the previous lecture, under the Bretton Woods Agreement, there are fixed exchange rates, okay? So the exchange rates between all these different countries were, were fixed, they were set in stone, which could, which made this goal of a single EEC currency perhaps plausible, but when Nixon exits that system in 1971, that constitutes quite a, quite a setback toward a European currency, because now, with the end of Bretton Woods, we had uh, floating exchange rates between national currencies, replacing the fixed exchange rates under Bretton Woods. 1973, the EEC expanded to include the United Kingdom and also Denmark. And then in 1979, the EEC created a Bretton Woods, a sort of mini Bretton Woods replacement for the EEC called the European Monetary System. And what the European Monetary System did was it attempted to stabilize exchange rates between national currencies and, and to essentially create fixed exchange rates for members of the EEC. So 
1979 and after, the members of the EEC still retain their own national currencies, but now through the European monetary system, there's greater stabilization there, a more fixed exchange rate. And countries that belong to the EEC peg their currencies to a new accounting unit called the European Currency Unit, the ECU. Now the ECU was not a physical currency. You did not, you know, normal consumers did not deal in it or transact in it. It was simply an accounting currency used only by members of the EEC to stabilize those exchange rates. So under Bretton Woods, from 1944 to 1971, the US dollar pegged to gold at $35 an ounce was the, the standard, that was the peg, okay? And F, from 1979 through the, rest, through the remainder of the 20th century, the ECU, the European Currency Unit, acts in that, in that uh, function, okay? So again, it's not a, this is not the Euro, but it's a step in that direction. And this European Currency Unit, the way that value was determined was the ECU was a basket of the different currencies, the different national currencies of members in the EEC. Okay, so here you see the ECU and there's a basket and you see the French flag, the, the Union Jack, the Belgian flag, the Italian flag, and so forth. 1979, the first parliament of the EEC convened. Very, very weak, not, not you know, did not uh, exercise substantial powers by any stretch of the imagination. However, another step toward a European Union. In the 1980s, the EEC expanded to now include Greece, Spain, Portugal, and in 1986, the EEC adopted a new European flag, and there it is. And it has 12 stars because in 1986, there were 12 member states of the EEC. Now, it's not yet called the European Union. Still, the European economic community is seen as a common market and as a, an economic agreement. That changes in 1992. In 1992 in Maastricht, in the Netherlands, a treaty was signed between members of the EEC called the Maastricht Treaty. And this is what establishes the European Union under its current name. The Maastricht Treaty introduced the concept of European citizenship, created a complete uh, single economic market, free movement of people, which didn't exist before that time before that treaty, free movement of people, free movement of goods, free movement of capital, a single market. And then it laid the grounds for an eventual single currency. Didn't give a name to it yet, but the treaty made clear that there will be a single currency coming, coming soon. And according to the Maastricht Treaty, if you were within the European Union, if you were a member state within the European Union, upon meeting certain budgetary fiscal criteria, you were obligated, you would be obligated under by treaty to adopt this new European currency. And the criteria were you had to have a budget deficit of less than 3% GDP and you had to have a debt ratio of less than 60% GDP. So those were the criteria. If, you, if you're a member state in the European Union and you met those criteria, you were obligated by treaty to adopt this new currency, which again, isn't yet in, in existence in 1992, but the, uh, it will be shortly. Uh, the name Euro is not, does not come out until 1995. So in 1995, the name is announced. And the currency does not officially begin until 1999. 
And even then, only as an accounting unit, it's not until 2002, January of 2002, that physical euros with euro coins are, uh, or excuse me, enter circulation. So these were the signatories to the Maastricht Treaty. So you have the European Economic Community, all of those countries. Now a united Germany, because with the fall of the Soviet Union, East Germany unified with West Germany. Now we have a unified Germany plus Sweden and Finland. The Maastricht Treaty actually doesn't go into effect until 1993. So really it's 1993 that the European Union begins, but the treaty was signed in 92. Euro replaced the ECU as the official accounting currency of the EU in 1999. And it was at a one-to-one -one ratio with the ECU. And in January of 2002, physical euro coins and banknotes entered circulation. And there they are. Very colorful currency compared to the US dollar. Now, there was a lot of opposition from the beginning to a single currency. Both Britain and Denmark negotiated exemptions to this requirement that they adopt a single currency upon meeting certain criteria. Margaret Thatcher, who is the British Conservative Prime Minister from 1979 to 1990, was staunchly opposed to further European integration, or at least skeptical, we'll say that, and absolutely opposed surrendering the British pound and adopting the euro. Margaret Thatcher, you can watch them on YouTube, they're actually pretty good speeches, you know, just hammering away, we will not surrender the British pound, uh, we will not adopt a single European currency. And then her successor, who was also a conservative, Prime Minister John Major, was a, a PM of uh, the United Kingdom at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, and Britain was able to negotiate an exemption to that. So Britain, even while Britain was in the European Union, was not compelled to accept the euro. Denmark also negotiated, negotiated an exemption. In 2000, they had a popular referendum. The Danish currency is called the Krone. And in the referendum, the people voted, we don't want to have the euro. And they voted to retain the Krone. However, the Krone is pegged to the to the euro so you see here that uh, Denmark has the the lighter blue but they've retained the crown Sweden actually had a referendum in 2003 and the people in Sweden voted against adopting the euro uh, the Swedish currency is called a krona and so Every time the question of the euro has gone to referendum, the, the voters have voted no. In the vast majority of countries within the EU, there was never a referendum on the, on the euro. And um, in Germany, there was actually hesitation among the German government to, to give up control of the Deutschmark. Uh, it narrowly, narrowly passed in the, uh, within uh, the German government. And then France as well was very skeptical of, uh, of giving up control of the franc and accepting the euro, but that also won very narrow approval within the French government. So there's the British pound. And, and note, one of the advantages of having national currencies is that you can place national figures, figures of importance, of cultural significance onto your note. So there's Queen Elizabeth, of course, a uh, knight. I'm not sure who that particular man is. Uh, maybe William the Conqueror. There, William Shakespeare, all right. There's William Shakespeare, very beautiful note, 20 pound note. There's William Shakespeare on stage, Queen Elizabeth the first watching. Okay, you're not gonna see that on a Euro because a Euro is all of Europe. But with the British pound, you can have these special figures. And these are, British pound coins, two pence, 10 pence, one pound, two pounds. The British actually decimalized the pound back in the 1970s. And here's the Danish kroner. So this was the, uh, 
the currency that the Danes retained because the, the voters voted down the euro in the referendum. I do not, I don't know who these figures are, but obviously uh, of some uh, significance, cultural significance to the Danish people. Italy did not retain the lira. Look at the old Italian lira. There is uh, Raphael, the famous Renaissance painter, Leonardo da Vinci, replaced by this. There's the Greek drachma. Beautiful notes. Greek culture, replaced by this, okay? Already noted the Swedish rejected the euro in a 2003 referendum and have retained their own national currency with figures of cultural significance. French franc, as I noted, uh, was not saved. There's a picture of Voltaire, Descartes, famous philosopher, replaced by this. Same in Germany, some hesitation, but ultimately adopted the Deutschmark. In their case, it wasn't just the cultural significance of the notes, but also the Deutschmark was a very strong currency. It was a major reserve currency around the world. Deutschmark also replaced with by the Euro. Although Germany is far and away the most influential member economically within the European Union, and that's actually where the European Central Bank is, and this is one of the criticisms of the Euro, is that it is essentially controlled by Germany, the greatest economic powerhouse in the EU. There's the ECB, and the ECB seated in Frankfurt, Germany, and this is the central bank that sets EU monetary policy. And look at this, EU expansion, 1995, Look at by 2004. 2004 was the biggest enlargement in EU history. Cyprus, the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, all joined in 2004. In 2007, Romania and Bulgaria also joined. So look at the look at the EU in 2007. This is really the EU at its peak. The UK is still in, and then all of these Eastern European countries are in. And in 2007, the European debt crisis had not yet begun. So this begins the next section of our lecture, the European debt crisis, or it's sometimes known as the Eurozone crisis. This was a, a period of time, and it I have 2009 to present. However, arguably within the last couple of years, it is has settled down, really peaked perhaps in 2015, but there are still issues, problems here. But these were uh, the debt crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis refers to this phenomenon of, of weaker Eurozone members, particularly Greece, Ireland, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Cyprus, mm -hmm. who had just uh, debt levels off the charts after 2009. And it was really a ticking time bomb for the Euro. And debt to GDP ratios just off the charts, way, way higher than the requirement under the Maastricht Treaty, which was under 60%. There's Greece, and you'll see the uh, progression from 2008 to 2012. Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, all over 100% debt to GDP ratio. Now the other countries weren't doing so hot either. I mean, France and the UK are over 80%. But the worst were these five. There's Ireland. So in the green is the Eurozone average. There's Ireland, Portugal. This is debt to GDP. And look at Greece. Greece was the most uh, obviously a famous exception, notorious exception. Um, peaking at 183% debt-to-GDP ratio in early 2015. So what caused this 
crisis? Well, one of the causes was this very rapid expansion in the EU, and there was this uh, fervor, this eagerness within the EU, within or excuse me, within uh, among the leadership in the EU, not necessarily among the people, but among the leadership in the EU to expand and to expand quickly. And from especially 2002 to 2007, but even a little bit before that, uh, weaker member states within the EU were almost encouraged to uh, to mask the, their true deficits, okay, and and to uh, you know get around some of the stricter requirements under the Maastricht Treaty for adopting the euro, because the EU political class wanted the euro to be used throughout most of the European Union. And so to do that, they've got to meet the, those budgetary uh, criteria. And so you encourage these countries to, to uh, engage in some accounting tricks, some fiscal tricks. Uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, worked out a deal with the Greek government to help uh, them sidestep Eurozone criteria through a number of very complicated techniques. Moreover, during this period, the ECB adopted very low interest rates, which incentivized investors in Northern Europe, which is much wealthier than Southern Europe. Investors in Northern Europe and in, and in the Western half of Europe to, to lend to the South or to lend to the East. And then the South and the East were incentivized to borrow because interest rate rates were so low. What this amounted to was a, an accumulation of debts in the South owed to creditors in, in the North and just led to really big uh, substantial uh, deficits. And the South became, South and East became utterly dependent on, on foreign lending. And in 2009, when the financial crisis hit, not just Europe, but also the United States, when the financial crisis hit, uh, all of the incoming foreign capital that had been going into those countries uh, was cut off and stopped, halted. And, and this is what led to the, to the crisis. Uh, moreover, because of the financial crisis, there were banks in many of these weaker Eurozone countries that were going under, just like in our country. And these banks had uh, all of these uh, junk assets, toxic, toxic assets that whose underlying financial value was not what they said it was, no longer had a liquid market. So these banks uh, uh, demanded bailouts. And the precedent was had already been set to bail out the banking system. We did that in this country with the TARP bailout in October 2008. So you have a combination of bank bailouts plus just unsustainable trade deficits and a lot of deficit spending, okay? Because borrowing had become so cheap, encouraged by the ECB. So all in all, what this amount led to was a, a sharp increase in what's called sovereign debt, debt belonging to these weaker Eurozone countries. This led then to increased bond yields, which led to a crisis in bond markets. And, and a crisis in repaying that debt. And the difficulty here in countries like Greece, but also Spain and Portugal and, and, uh, and, uh, and elsewhere, was that these Eurozone countries had surrendered their own monetary authority to the ECB in Frankfurt, Germany. Oh one of the creditors, one of the major creditors to these weaker Eurozone countries. So the creditor controlled the money in those weaker countries. Back before the Euro, a nation like Greece or Spain or Portugal or Italy could respond to this crisis by devaluing their currency, right? Now devaluation has a lot of problems, okay? It causes the currency to, to lower in value, right? Uh, which is attendant with all these different secondary consequences that are not necessarily favorable, okay? But it does allow that sovereign country to do something about, you know, a particular fiscal crisis. During World War I, uh, 
uh, the U.S. inflated its currency to pay for the war. Okay, there's, there's some devaluation there. During the 1930s, FDR devalued the dollar. Okay, changed the definition of the dollar in terms of gold. So this is a common historical practice of sovereign states. In fact, if you remember from earlier in our in this series, in this, in this uh, course, I noted how the right to issue money is one of the key hallmarks of sovereignty, of political sovereignty. Well, these nations had surrendered that monetary sovereignty to a foreign entity, the ECB, okay? But they were sold, the way, the way it was sold was, oh, this isn't a foreign entity. This is, you're in the European Union, you're a member state. But in reality, that authority was transferred to a foreign entity. It's in Frankfurt, Germany, and it's controlled by outside creditors. And so that option of devaluation was not available to these countries. So here's a graph of the interest rates. And you'll see how, oh man, so these were uh, the yields, bond yields. Look at in Greece at the, at, at, some of the peaks here in 2011, 2012, almost 30%. But then you see some of the others. Just uh, interest rates went off the charts. And the largest European creditors, uh, Germany, led the way. But also the IMF, the ECB, This is a great cartoon, Angela Merkel, the Eurozone, demanding, there, there she is with her purse, uh, demanding more money from the weaker countries who are just barely making it. That's a great cartoon. Angela Merkel, Merkel, Chancellor of Germany from 2005 to the present day, so she's been the head of state in Germany for a very long time. And part of the, uh, negotiations that happened between these creditors to the weaker Eurozone countries, they said, okay, here's, here's the deal. We'll bail you out, but as a condition for any you know rescue packages or bailouts, you're going to have to adopt what was called austerity. Austerity programs uh, forced upon these countries by outside creditors, the IMF, the ECB, Germany, France to a lesser, lesser extent, for those countries to reduce their budget deficits, meaning higher taxes, very uh, 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 deep spending cuts, and cuts to pension systems. Now, granted, you know some of the many of the pensions in many of these countries had gotten out of control. But when you you're spiking taxes and huge spending cuts, the result is economic disaster. And again, devaluation was not available to these countries as an option. So this was really the only option that was given to them. So as a result of forced austerity in places like Greece and Spain, unemployment peaked at uh, at one point at 27 percent, 27 percent unemployment. Oh, here. OK, so I, I was looking for these numbers earlier uh, in early 2015, Greece, for example, had three hundred and twenty three billion euros in debt. So Greece was in debt 323 billion euros. Over a third of this debt was owned by creditors in Germany, France, and Italy, amounting to 130 billion euros. The IMF was owned 32 billion euros. The ECB was, was owed 20 billion euros. And then various European banks were owed just over 2 billion euros. Now, the institutions that managed these negotiations for rescue packages, as they were called, and bailouts to these weaker countries were collectively nicknamed the European Troika. That is the IMF, which we've talked about already at length in this course, International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission. The European Commission is the executive branch of the EU. It is an unelected branch of the EU. It is a, uh, members of the European Commission are appointed by the European Council, which is also unelected. The European Council consists of all the different heads of state of the, of the various countries within the EU. 
So these three institutions combined were the European Troika. The managing director of the IMF was Christine Lagarde, and she was Christine Lagarde, a French uh, lawyer and politician. She was managing director of the IMF from 2011 to until September 2019, so not too long ago, after which she be, became president of the ECB. So again, you had this revolving door where go from IMF, now she's president of the European Central Bank. Today, at one point in, uh, in the thick of the crisis in 2012, in an interview, Christine Lagarde said that the Greeks, quote, had a nice time in the 2000s, but now, quote, it is payback time. <laughs> it's payback time, Greece. Uh, ignoring the fact that Greece was encouraged to engage in all of that, you know, uh, uh, the, the fiscal deficits and the, and the borrowing by the European Union institutions, economic institutions, especially the ECB, and by banks who, who intentionally sidestepped all of the all of the requirements under the Maastricht Treaty for Greece to, to remain uh, within uh, solvency. So yeah, that's, there's the Greek debt crisis. Huge protests in the streets in, 2015, um, in 2015, there was a, uh, a referendum in Greece. Greece had already been given uh, a bailout package by the, by the IMF in May 2010. Then there was another bailout package in March 2002, accompanied by austerity. And then in early 2015, Greece was on the verge of another default, and they were offered a third bailout pa package with, with even stricter austerity measures. And it was brought to a referendum, and 60% of Greece voted no. The prime minister of Greece, Alexis Cyprus ran on a, uh, he was a, a socialist, ran on an anti-austerity, anti-bailout program. The, uh, the referendum voted no, and uh, Greece uh, failed to make an IMF loan payment on time in June of 2015. The banks closed around the country, and then in July of 2015, Eurozone leaders were able to negotiate with the prime minister a third bailout package that was actually not all that different from the one the voters had rejected. And as a result, Prime Minister Cyprus uh, saw a, a dip in popularity. And uh, But since, since 2015, the peak of the crisis, 2011-2012, interest rates spiked a little bit again, 2015. But since then, um, Greek bonds have have lowered, have lessened, and and things have calmed down a little bit. Now, as for the value of the euro relative to the dollar, and yes, the uh, euro notes are a little uh, wider and yet not quite as long as the uh, our dollar bills here in the USA. Here is a history of the euro from uh, 2002 to the current day. And you see it was roughly at par with the dollar. The peak was in 2007, where it reached, where uh, to, to buy a euro, you needed about a dollar and 60 cents. Very strong euro in 2006, 2007. Uh, it then took quite a big hit on a number of occasions here. Really big drop in 2014. Between July 2014 and March 2015, the euro fell from a dollar and thirty-six cents to a dollar four cents. That was a twenty-four percent decline within a matter of uh, about nine months or so. Just a lack of confidence in in the euro, and uh, and also responding to the fact that the ECB had pumped so much money into the system in order to maintain capital flows between the European banks, went up a little bit. Uh, later, but you know it's hovering around here today. So you know it's not terribly expensive to to go to Europe. I actually went 
for a month-long backpacking trip in Europe in, in uh, summer 2007. It was expensive, man. It was really expensive. I think at the time that I went, it was like a dollar forty-five exchange rate. But uh, anyway, all right, and there's the Union Jack. And although the United Kingdom never adopted the euro, they always retained the British pound, I would be remiss to not mention the referendum in June of 2016 where a solid majority, 52% of the British people voted to leave the European Union and what's called Brexit. This shocked the political class in Europe, but it was a movement that had been building for a long time, for many years. People, more and more people within Great Britain, as well as in other countries, have been uh, more and more skeptical of the so-called European project. This movement is called Euroskepticism, skepticism, and it transcends left and right. Okay, you see people on the left who are Euroskeptics, you see people on the right who are Euroskeptics. What they have in common is that they would like to reclaim national sovereignty, and they, they believe too much sovereignty has been handed over to Brussels, which is where the European Union is located, and so the British people voted to leave. And uh, I have to say, just to put my own cards on the table, I was very proud of the British people that day. I was cheering them on. Actually, I was first introduced to Nigel Farage back in 2009 when he objected to the way the Irish people were treated by the European Union uh, over the Lisbon Treaty. Get to that in a second. So I've been following this for a while, and uh, it, I think it was a, a good thing for Britain. I also think the doomsdayers turned out to be incorrect. Christine Lagarde, for example, said that if the if the Brits leave the European Union, there will be a lot of, quote, pain. It hasn't really turned out to be the case. And I think it is good and right that the British people should determine their own political destiny and economic destiny, uh, independent of, of what uh, unelected officials uh, dictate to them from, from Brussels. And that's one of the problems with the European Union is the so-called democratic deficit. And a lot of people have said things on this. The democratic deficit is this idea that the European, though ostensibly democratic, is in actuality quite undemocratic. If you look at the different institutions within the European uh, government as it's become, remember the European Union began as uh, a project of economic integration, but it has more and more become a political union and become one of political integration and there is a very small class, uh, an oligarchical type class that controls most of the halls of power within or inside Brussels. The one democratic institution within the European Union is the European Parliament, but the European Parliament is remarkably weak. In fact, it, you can't really call it a proper parliament at all because it lacks the, uh, the ability to initiate legislation. In most lower houses of parliament or Congress, in our case, the House of Representatives, the House of Commons, other legislative bodies, that house has the right to introduce bills, introduce legislation. Not the case in the European Parliament. Only the executive branch, the European Commission, has the right to initiate or to introduce legislation. And the European Commission is unelected. Members of the European Commission are appointed by the upper house of the European Parliament, and the upper house is unelected as well. The upper house cons consists of the different heads of state of the different member states within the EU. And you could say, well, those heads of states are heads of state are elected. Nonetheless, the upper house is not directly elected by the people, and they're the one. And the upper house appoints the executive branch, which has the sole right of of legislation. More than just that, however. Uh, time and time again, whenever a major issue of importance has come, come up within the European Union, there's been a strong reluctance to allow any referendums. And most of the time there's a referendum on a big European question. The people vote against the Brussels, uh, the Brussels consensus. Let me give you a couple examples. Well, I already had one of, of the Swedes. Swedes in 2003 by referendum voted against adopting the euro. Then in 2005, there was a new treaty. It was called the Treaty of Nice. 
And this would uh, aim to create a new constitution for the EU that would further politically integrate the EU, that would strengthen the political powers of the EU. Well, this treaty was created in only three countries was a referendum allowed on whether or not to approve the Treaty of Nice in 2005. In one of those three countries, Spain, it was approved. But in two of those countries, France and the Netherlands, voters rejected the treaty. And so the treaty was null and void. Then, three years later, in 2008, a new treaty was introduced. It was basically the same as the old. It's called the Lisbon Treaty. But this time, the French and the Dutch were not allowed a referendum. Only one country managed to slip in a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, and that was Ireland. Ireland, the, the Irish voters in 2008, rejected the Lisbon Treaty. But then Brussels said, you're going to need to vote on it again. So essentially, you voted the wrong way. And in 2009, compelled the Irish people to vote a second time to get it right this time. And, and in 2009, after big threats of, oh, I Ireland will, will uh, be... Uh, its economy will collapse and you know, all the doomsday predictions. Ireland barely, barely passed the Lisbon Treaty. And so uh, this Eurosceptic movement within Europe has been building and building. As more and more people see the, the, the flaws of political and economic integration. This lecture we've talked about the flaws of the economic and monetary integration. Um, you can't take people, uh, you know, large groups of people who are very, very, very different from one another, different religions, different languages, different cultures, different histories, and lump them all into one political union governed under a single umbrella of rules and, and laws and, and such. Uh, that's not going to work, but especially a single, not just a single political union, you're not going to get a single cultural union because there's not a common culture. There are similarities, there are parallels, there are overlaps, but there are also distinct differences. It's very different than the United States. Europe is not like the United States. And, and, and actually, if you look at the USA, we have tremendous differences too. And one has to wonder how much longer our union can, can last as currently constituted. That's a different subject. subject. But, but especially one monetary umbrella. And that was really the point of this lecture. To, to throw all these different countries with very, very, very different economies under a single monetary umbrella was a mistake from the start, all right? It was a mistake from the start. And so, you know, Brexit Day, this is when Britain formally left the European Union, January 31st, 2020. And I think it was, it was good. And you can come up with treaties and agreements with, with the majority of European nations where you have common trade, you know, you have some of the ideals of the original Treaty of Rome. But but this I but the way the EU morphed in the 90s and and in the 2000s, what it, it went in the wrong direction, in my view. And so, you know, I think it's good for nations to retain monetary sovereignty. Bank of England. Right. Uh, and and I hope that some of the lessons from the last 10 years will will lead to other other Brexits across Europe. Obviously, a lot of people, maybe some of the people watching this video will staunchly disagree. That is your right. But uh, anyway, here's a chart of the a graph of the uh, value of the British pound relative to the dollar beginning around 2004. So you look at it, the pound was very, very expensive around this time. In fact, I, uh, I visited Britain, as I noted before, uh, it was in other European countries as well, but I was in Britain also in 2007. And all I can remember, man, it's expensive here to buy a pound. I needed $2 to buy a single pound. And uh, very, very expensive at that time. Well, 2008 crisis, the financial crisis in 08 and 09, look at that, just huge plunge in the value of the pound. I mean, that's massive, massive plunge. You look at Brexit, yeah, it went down a little bit, but the pound has retained most, you know, most of its value and, uh, and, and it's all good, it's all good. But uh, anyway, all right, I'll leave it there. Hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you can pardon some of the opining there, perhaps at the end. 
Uh, I'm about to record the Bitcoin lecture, cryptocurrencies. Really excited about that one. You're going to want to watch it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching this lecture, and I will see you next time. Bye.